Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're going to um, depart from our typical sermon here and do a text study. Um, our ushers have handed out the source sheets, so you should have those. The question that I, I'm thinking about this week with Parashat Pinchas is what's in a name? What's in a name? And on, on one hand, we know that um, a rose by any name would smell as sweet, so nothing. A name doesn't need to be important at all. It's just a name. But on the other hand, we know that in Judaism, there's so much meaning and story and legacy wrapped up in names. So I want to start by asking you to name some of our heroes from Torah and what the significance of their name is. Go for it, Rachel. <laughs> so Rachel is starting with Noah, uh, my daughter's name, your granddaughter's name, who stood up for her rights as a woman, you said. And we're going to talk about that as well. So that's, she's one of the daughters of Slothchad, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, so that's a great example. Yes. Elliot. Good. So Elliot is saying Moshe, whose name is, is derived from being drawn out of the water, right? Bat Paro draws him from the Nile. Um, but Elliot is saying that it's significant because of humility, right? Humble beginnings being drawn out from the water. Good. Anybody else? There are a million examples. Go ahead. Yes. Good, so that's a Jeopardy daily double. So you got uh, Yaakov and Yisrael. Yaakov actually comes from Ekev, from heel, right? Because he's struggling with Esau in the womb, grabs him by the heel, and he, right? So and who comes first? Who's at the heel? Who's, so there's that significance, but then he wrestles with an angel and becomes Yisrael to struggle with God. And that's where we get our name as a people because we question, we value questions and struggling and so much more the process sometimes than the answer. Right, Yisrael, beautiful. Go ahead, Hedy, yeah. Exactly, Yitzchak, Isaac, comes from the fact that Sarah laughed. Are we going to have kids in our old age? Right, so Matzchik, there's laughter in his name, Yitzchak. Good, so you can see it's just one after another that the names often have a crucial significance either to tell the story of this hero uh, or maybe the legacy, where they come from, or where we're going. So I want to jump into um, our first verse from this week's Parsha, from Pinchas. And you see there's a lot of names. And the names have special significance, as we've been primed to expect at this stage. Um, by the way, in this week's Parsha, we also have, which I didn't bring, the census, where we take account after the plague of all of, uh, you know, 20 and up. Um, and we get name after name. And you might ask yourself, why does the Torah spend so much time on, on outlining all of these names. So again, that importance of names. Uh, I'm going to read for us, just because I have the mic. Uh, this is from Numbers 27, verse 1. And I, it goes through verse 7, and I've taken excerpts. The daughters of Tzlofechad, of Manassite family, keep in mind how many names are being put here. Son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, son of Joseph, came forward. The names of the daughters... Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza, to say, let not our father's name be lost to his clan just because he had no son. Give us a holding among our father's kinsmen. And God said to Moses, the plea of Tzlovchad's daughters is just. Ken, Benot Tzlovchad, Dovrot. So a couple things of note here. For one, uh, just for context, only the men of the, of the tribes, the men, inherit the land. But here we have an example, a situation where the, the daughters, somebody, a man had only daughters and no sons. And so the daughters come to Moses and say, should our father, who was righteous, he was not part of Korach's rebellion, he was righteous, should he not be able to pass on his inheritance to his children because he had no sons? And Moses ponders this and, and doesn't have an answer right away, goes to God, and God says, 
daughters of Slavchad speak just. Their word is ken. Yes, their word is nachon. It's correct. They should inherit. Which is interesting for so many reasons as Rachel Schwartz, as Rachel Schwartz was pointing out um, that it's women standing up for their rights in a way that is revolutionary and it's one of the ways in which our text is so ahead of its time because it includes an episode like this that's nothing short of revolutionary where God, God's self, is saying they're right. And you can look at this a couple of ways. You can say, is it actually possible that God forgot or God left that out? Why wasn't it there to begin with? And our commentators ask that. Why did they even need to come forward? Torah is perfect. It should have been there to begin with. And the answer, which we'll arc to in the end here, is that it's not that God forgot. It's not that God left it out. It's that God was waiting for them to make a move. And we're going to see in the, the significance of their names that movement is, is key. You'll see it's a recurring theme. But I love that. And we talk about this on Shavuot often, about how we're partners with God in Revelation, just as we are partners with God in creation, that God wants our participation in unfolding Torah. And so God waits for them to say, hey, something needs to be completed here. And God says, yes, I've been waiting for you. So um, what I want to move on to next is one of the other sort of um, extraneous things here is why couldn't they just have said Slovchad of Manasha, right? Why did we have to keep going with all these additional names? And Rashi comes forward and explains, of the families of Manasha, the son of Joseph, why is this stated, Rashi asks? Has it not already been said, Ben Manasha? And consequently, we know that they belong to the family of Manasha, the son of Joseph. Why did it also have to say the son of Joseph, is, is Rashi's question. And he answers, but it is to suggest that just as Joseph held the promised land dear, as it is said, and ye shall bring up my bones from here. Remember, Joseph made uh, the children of Israel promise that when they are freed from Egypt, that they will carry Joseph's bones out of Egypt to be buried in the promised land in Israel. So too, his daughters held the land dear, as it is said, give us an inheritance. So the reason that Joseph is being invoked specifically by name is to say that look at how the daughters of Slovchad are carrying on the legacy of Joseph. Joseph who said, I, I need to be buried in Israel. By no, th th no way in, in heck am I <laughs> staying in Egypt, right? Bring up my bones, even beyond my death, post-mortem, bury me in the Holy Land. And here, the descendants of not just Manasseh, but specifically Joseph, because names carry legacy and carry purpose, they are saying, give me a land. Give me, it, it's not right for us not to get a piece of this glorious, sacred pie, right? Give us a land in Israel. Give us inheritance. So they're carrying on the legacy of Joseph in particular. Um, now I want to do a little bit of Midrash. Skip the next uh, source and turn to the back here, where we're going to dive into the names of Tzlovchad and the daughters in particular. This is written by Rivka Lubitsch, who is a contemporary Israeli um, Midrashist. She's, she's a woman who creates Midrash, which in itself is also uh, very controversial, particularly in the Orthodox world, where women are not um, allowed to study Talmud, right? The Beit Midrash is, is for men. So not only is she studying Talmud, she's creating Midrash. Here's what she writes. Why were they referred to first as the daughters of Tzlovchad and only afterwards by their own names? So she's pointing out that when you look back at that first verse, it's, it says, Betikravna benot Tzlovchad. The daughters of Tzlovchad came together, but it just refers to them as the daughters of Tzlovchad and only later do we actually get their names, right? Often in Torah, women are not always named, but, but are the daughter of or the wife of a male. But here, they're, they're later named. But why first the daughters of Slovchad and only afterwards by their own names? And, and the, she, she's now drashing. She's giving a, a midrash on the name Slovchad. Because of the tzel and pachad. Tzel is shadow. Pachad is fear. Slovchad. Tzel, pachad. Because of the shadow and fear that was in them at first. For at first they dwelled in their father's shadow and feared to raise their heads. Once they drew near to one another, they were empowered and known by their own names, as it is written, and the daughters of Slavchad drew near, and these are his daughter's names. So they sort of earned their names here by stepping forward. 
by coming together as a group of sisters and giving each other power and courage, they then earn their names. They step out from underneath the shadow of their father and are named specifically. Um, I'll just say when we uh, had the extraordinary privilege of naming our daughter Noah here in front of you just a couple of weekends ago, I was talking, I think it was, I don't want to embarrass her, but I think it was with Meryl. And I was saying, oh my God, it was perfect. Noah was totally quiet during the, I, I was sure she was going to cry, I was sure, but she was quiet. And, and Meryl reminded me, but if, if she wasn't, if she was crying, that would have been okay too. She's finding her voice. And I thought, there we go. Un unintentionally, I was sort of in a way stifling the voice of my own daughter, whom I named Noah because of her courageous voice. <laughs> um, number two, rightly, can Dutzlov Chad's daughters speak? Tanot asked God. This, by the way, is another unnamed uh, female character who is the daughter of Yiftach, the judge who sacrifices his daughter in a tragic story. They give her the name Tanot. Um, Tanot asked God, if Slovchad's daughter spoke the truth, why didn't you write that in your Torah in the first place? This is the question that I brought up before. For after all, you are truth and your Torah is truth and your word endures forever. God answered, truth will go, grow from the ground. Quoting from Psalms that God is, again, waiting on people sometimes to be the initiative of Torah as well, not just receiving it from on high. Tanot asked, but is it not written God's Torah is whole? Right? Isn't it perfect? It shouldn't need our intervention. That's from Psalms. But God answered her, I already wrote in my Torah, be wholehearted with God your Lord. Meaning, yeah, Torah is whole, but I created you to be wholehearted. You are the wholeness that I'm waiting for. You're that extra ingredient of wholeness to complete the, uh, the process of Torah. And what's, uh, and what's more, I wrote, walk before me and be wholehearted. She continues, there is truth that descends from on high and there is truth that grows from below. Blessed is the generation in which truth from above meets truth from below. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. This meeting place of Torah that comes from on high and Torah that emerges from below, from us. And this is what scripture means when it says truth will grow from the ground and justice look down from heaven, from Psalms. And here's how she ends her midrash. The cynics of the time said, Slovchad's daughters are hypocrites. They said they're doing this for their own power. That's what the critics said, that, that they're actually not in it for, for justice or, for, or uh, for, for Torah. They're in it for themselves, right? They did it for their own power, their own prosperity, to make themselves men's equals when it comes to inheritance. They aren't doing it for the sake of heaven, the critics say. That is why the Torah says Ken to silence the critics. To say that here it is, God is saying ken, rightly as an honest, kenut, and rightly as in correct, nachon. They act for their own power. They act for their own prosperity. They act to make themselves men's equals when it comes to inheritance. And they act for the sake of heaven. So it's ken to all of it. In response to the critics saying that they're only in for themselves, uh, our midrash is saying that God says yes to all of it. Yes, they are in it for themselves, but that is for the sake of Torah. <laughs> their cause is just. It's okay that they're taking a stand for their own elevation because that's what's right and just in this case. So I want to conclude in just a moment, but I want to look again at names. And if you look at the daughters of Slovchad, Machla, this was a question that... Uh, that Ruth had asked once in our, in our uh, Lunch and Learn, and I never got back to you, so I'm finally paying the debt I owe you of doing research into the name Machla, because you would think it means sickly, like chole. But uh, uh, what I was able to find in the in this research is that chul, and you can you can say that, that I'm wrong in this, but that chul means to dance in some way. So Machla actually is another form of movement. Noah is movement, literally movement. Um, chogla. Milka, uh, there's holech in Milka, lech, which is to go, to move, and tirza. These are all movement names. And so it's, it's interesting that here they are sort of, as Rachel started out this discussion, carrying forth a movement um, of justice and equality. Um, so I just, I want to end in that space with saying that names could mean so much, and in Judaism, they do. But what's important to note is that 
the name that we're given is only half of our name, right? The name that we're given, which comes with legacy and may also come with limitation, is only half of the name we're given. The other half is the name that we create for ourselves, right? Finer than rubies is the crown of a good name, the legacy that we leave behind, the name that we create irrespective of where we come from or the name that was given. Um, so with our names comes so much potential, but there's always the name that we leave behind that only we can define and only we can determine and only we can move and carry forward from generation to generation. So I wanna bless us all that we carry our names proudly, B'nai Yisrael, both as a collective and individually. And I'll end with just one ask that at, at, Kiddush, at Kiddush today, if you look around and you see anybody whose name you don't know, that you introduce yourself and tell them your name so they can tell you yours. <laughs>